We warmly welcome everyone to our midweek meeting. Let's begin our midweek meeting today by singing song number 108 titled God's Loyal Love. Afterwards, we'll offer prayer to Jehovah. Again, that's song 108. Our opening song emphasized Jehovah's loyal love, which perfectly sets the tone for much of our program this week. First, in the Treasures from God's Word section of our meeting, the account of Ruth and Naomi will be discussed, and it highlights the quality of loyal love. During the discussion, look for ways this quality was shown and consider what it might mean for you today. Then, in the living as Christians portion, notice how this same quality is being manifested by the governing body uh, in how they help God's people navigate through this crumbling world. It will build a new appreciation for our loving God. Now, let's give our attention to Brother Simon Bosiewski for the first portion of Treasures from God's Word, Pursue Loyal Love. To begin... Let's get an overview of the Bible book of Ruth by watching the following video. 
An Introduction to the Book of Ruth The prophet Samuel is believed to be the writer of this book. The Book of Ruth was completed about 1090 BCE. The events related cover a period early in the time of the Judges. The book takes its name from one of its principal characters, Ruth the Moabitess. The other main characters are Naomi and Boaz. In chapter 1, a famine moves a man named Elimelech to take his family from Bethlehem to the land of Moab. In Moab, Elimelech dies. His sons Malin and Kilian marry the Moabite women Ruth and Orpah. Some ten years later, both sons also die. Naomi, in deep despair, decides to return to Bethlehem. She urges her daughters-in-law to go back to their families. Orpah returns to her people. Ruth, however, sticks loyally to Naomi. When the two widows arrive at Bethlehem, the barley harvest has just begun. In chapter 2, Ruth, by chance, gleans in a field belonging to Boaz, who is related to Naomi's late husband. Recognizing Ruth's fine qualities, Boaz tells her to continue gleaning in his fields. When Ruth later tells Naomi that she had gleaned in the fields of a man named Boaz, Naomi says, The man is related to us. He is one of our repurchasers. In chapter 3, Naomi instructs Ruth to ask Boaz to act as repurchaser. He and Ruth could then raise up offspring for Naomi in order to carry on the family line of Elimelech. Boaz is willing to perform this loving deed, but he tells Ruth that Naomi has a closer male relative who could repurchase her. In chapter 4, Boaz goes to the Bethlehem city gate where he meets with the other male relative who is referred to as so-and-so. When the relative, in the presence of ten city elders, learns of his obligations, he declines to help. Boaz then publicly accepts the responsibilities of repurchaser. Boaz now marries Ruth, and they have a son, whom the neighbor women name Obed. Did you know? Boaz set a fine example of obedience to Jehovah. He did all in his power to help Naomi and Ruth by applying God's law on repurchase, taking no shortcuts. The book concludes, Obed became father to Jesse, and Jesse became father to David, who became a king of Israel and an ancestor of the Messiah. As you read the book of Ruth, See how Jehovah turns tragedy into triumph. Observe how he rewards those who love and obey him. And note how the book contributes to the history of David's family line, which produced the king of God's kingdom. Well, now that we have that nice background uh, on the book of Ruth, we're going to focus on just one lesson that we glean from this beautiful Bible book, really the theme for our consideration. And that is, Jehovah is pleased when we pursue loyal love. And to develop this theme, we're going to answer three questions. First of all, we'll discuss what is loyal love? How did Ruth show loyal love? And finally, how we can show loyal love today. But first, what is loyal love? Well, the glossary in our Bibles helps us there. It describes loyal love as a love motivated by commitment, integrity, loyalty, and deep attachment. This type of love often describes the love that Jehovah shows to his worshipers, but it can also apply to the love shown between humans, too. We think of the psalmist David in Psalm 63, verse 3, who said that Jehovah's loyal love was better than life. Yes, throughout the Bible, there are many examples of how Jehovah faithfully, loyally sticks 
to his faithful worshipers. He helps them, especially in difficult times. And that is what we see in the case of Naomi and Ruth. Even though they were going through a very hard time, Jehovah made sure that they were provided for. He did not abandon them. And no doubt one of the reasons that Jehovah loved Ruth was because she herself showed loyal love. Well, how did Ruth show loyal love? For one thing, she stuck with her mother-in-law, Naomi, during a difficult time. As we saw in the video, Naomi's husband had died. Her sons had died. What would she do? She decided that her, her best way forward would be to return to her homeland of Israel. But she was alone. She didn't have anything. In such a difficult situation, would Ruth abandon Naomi? Would Ruth just return to her close family? Well, notice what the Bible says. Probably some of the most touching words recorded in the Bible, really, at Ruth chapter 1 and verse 16. Ruth 1 and verse 16. But Ruth said, Do not plead with me to abandon you, to turn back from accompanying you. For where you go, I will go. And where you spend the night, I will spend the night. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. What quality do we see behind Ruth's expressions and her later actions? Loyal love. She refused to abandon Naomi in her time of need. And this involved making sacrifices. Ruth was willing to leave her homeland, her culture, her language, her people, with no guarantee that things would turn out well for her. Loyal love. We also see Ruth's loyal love to Jehovah in this verse because she refers to Naomi's God as her God, that is Jehovah. So while Ruth likely was raised in Moab, probably not to serve Jehovah, she had become a worshiper of Jehovah. And now she was not willing to abandon her worship of Jehovah to return to the gods of Moab. Again, loyal love. Well, how can we imitate Ruth's fine example? How can we show loyal love today? Well, we're surrounded by many dear brothers and sisters that are in Naomi-like circumstances. They're facing serious challenges. They may be coping with an illness, a financial hardship, experiencing the pain of losing a close family member or friend in death. We imitate Jehovah by showing loyal love to these ones. And as we see in the picture, there are various ways that we can show loyal love. It could involve having an encouraging conversation with someone, lending a listening ear, or perhaps offering some type of practical help. No matter what form our loyal love takes, what we want to remember, what makes loyal love special is its commitment, its deep attachment as we discussed earlier. Loyal love is not just showing kindness from time to time, on occasion. No, it involves sticking close to someone for the long haul, as it were, just as Jehovah sticks with us during the ups and downs of our lives. And consider the following experience that really helps us to see how our brothers and sisters are showing loyal love. This has to do with a Christian couple. The wife unexpectedly became pregnant and there were complications early on. The doctor told her and her husband that she would have to stay in bed for the rest of her pregnancy. She wouldn't be able to get up to do her normal household activities, chores, none of that, a real challenge. Well, one dear sister in their congregation took note of the situation. She called the brother at work and she said to him, I know this is a rough time for you. So until your wife gets back on her feet, you will have a hot dinner twice a week. And she did that faithfully for almost nine months, every Tuesday and every Friday. And what made that remarkable is that this sister did not have ideal circumstances. She herself was coping with a serious illness. So why did she insist on doing this? Well, she expressed that she felt Jehovah's love in her case. When she was not feeling well, he gave her the strength to keep going. And so now she wanted to show love to her brothers and sisters the same way Jehovah shows it to her. And what kind of love would that be? Loyal love for sure. 
So may all of us be determined to imitate Jehovah and some of the other wonderful examples we've discussed by showing loyal love. If we do, then we can look forward to the promise that Jehovah makes at Proverbs 21, 21, where it says that those who pursue loyal love will find life, righteousness, and glory. Thank you, Brother Borosiewski, for that wonderful review of that information. Now let's dig deeper and give our attention to Brother Michael Cologne as he draws out spiritual gems from this week's Bible reading assignment. Well, we look forward to everybody's well-prepared comments as we start the book of Ruth with chapters one and two. Now, to begin, who would like to read Ruth chapter one, verse 20 and 21? Brother Tiglis, please. Ruth chapter one, verse 20. She would say to the women, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I was full when I went, but Jehovah made me return empty handed. Why should you call me Naomi when it is Jehovah who opposed me and the Almighty who caused me calamity? Thank you very much. Now the question, why did Naomi say that Jehovah had made her life bitter? Brother Hilliard? And you're on mute, Brother Hilliard. Well, when she had originally left Bethlehem, she had her husband and her two sons, but when she returned, all of them had passed away. So her blaming Jehovah for her loss was absolutely wrong thinking, but we can certainly sympathize with why she felt that way. That must have been torturous pain for her. So uh, we can kind of apply that when if our brothers and sisters are going through hard times, if they're having some wild talk, uh, we can sympathize and be understanding with them and deal with them with kindness as well. Yes, thank you very much. And Sister Bradley? This was also a time period when lacking grandchildren or sons um, could be viewed as a, at times, you know, that was viewed as someone not having Jehovah's blessing. And so here, because she didn't have grandchildren, her two sons had died it may very well be that she felt Jehovah was humiliating, humiliating her for some reason. Mm -hmm, very good. Thank you. So now let's go ahead to the second question. What spiritual gems from this week's Bible reading would you like to share regarding Jehovah, the field ministry, or something else? Could we get uh, Sister Raggetts, please? Ruth had years of opportunity to observe and ponder the example set by Naomi. This good association, and perhaps listening to her late husband, apparently resulted in Ruth's gaining a desire to worship Jehovah. She abandoned the polytheism of the Moabites and said to her mother-in-law, your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Very nice, thank you. Uh, Brother Gregory. In Ruth 2, 10 and 11, uh, Naomi's talking to Boaz and she was asking really, why is Boaz being so kind to her? Why has he taken notice? Uh, and Boaz responds, a full report was made to me of all you have done for your mother-in-law. Uh, in the Watchtower article with that, it says that it's likely that Naomi was the one telling everyone in the town about what Ruth had done. So prior to this, we know that Naomi was being a little stubborn, not exactly uh, encouraging Ruth and her actions. But now we see that it's paying off uh, that Naomi is spreading to others all the good things that Ruth has done. So we see that our efforts can pay off as well. Good point. Thank you. Um, Sister Arroyo? That same comment that Boaz made of a full report was made to me of all you have done made me think that Ruth probably didn't think she was doing anything special. She was just focusing on doing what was right and working hard for Naomi to help her out. And that's a good example for us in this hard times, 
just focus on doing what's right, on working hard, and we'll definitely make a good name for us in front of Jehovah and our brothers and sisters. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, Sister Tiglis? In Ruth chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, I really appreciated the kindness that Boaz showed to Ruth just to help her ease her situation. He commanded his young man to pull out those ears of corn to leave them behind for her. And because of that, she gleaned an ephah or 30 pounds of barley. That's such a good reminder for us to think of small ways we can make life easier for others. And I was thinking maybe there's an older person with limitations and a small pre-cooked meal dropped at their door would be like 30 pounds of barley. Very nice. Uh, Brother Rodrigo? In Ruth chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, I can see that Boaz showed empathy to Ruth. He noticed that she wasn't from the area, so he made sure that she felt at ease by making her feel protected and welcome. He offered uh, good company and also offered waters for when she was thirsty after working so hard. So this teaches me that I can show empathy to new friends that move to my area and my congregation, maybe by making them feel welcome, showing them where they can get things done, maybe at a DMV, a DMV or a store where they are going to need uh, to get situated to the area. And I can also be empathetic to others by listening when they're expressing themselves. Exactly, very well. Uh, Sister Perez? Yeah, Ruth 1 and 5. Um, uh, sadly, when her two sons of Noemi passed, her two daughter-in-laws followed Noemi, and that's due to their close relationship they had. In the Watchtower of July 1st, 2012, it tells us that Noemi showed genuine kindness and love to her daughter-in-laws, hoping that they too would someday come to worship Jehovah as she did. So that just shows us that even though we go through hard times, it's very important to show that type of attitude because that can draw in family members that aren't in the truth, be interested in starting a relationship with Jehovah. Very good. Uh, Brother ba Bradley. In chapter two, verses 11 through 13, uh, Boaz gave commendation to Ruth. He, he mentioned this good report he'd heard about her. In verse 12, he said, may Jehovah reward you. But I like Ruth's response, what effect this had on her. She said that it comforted, comforted her. And then the footnote basically said that he spoke to her heart. And what a ex good example for me, uh, you know, as a shepherd, a reminder to the need to give encouragement to others. And everyone needs encouragement, even ones that are setting a good example and are recognized for their good work. They need encouragement, too. And so take advantage of an opportunity to commend them for what good they have done to, uh, to give them that comfort. Nice point. Uh, Brother Raggetts? The example of Ruth and Boaz show how doing unselfish deeds for others reaps blessings for the giver, because in both of their case, blessings overtook them because they showed loyal love for others. Ruth showed it toward Naomi, Boaz toward both of them, because if we act in harmony with Jehovah's requirements and do this, Jehovah does bless us. And we know that Ruth became uh, an ancestress to Jesus, but Boaz also became an ancestor to Jesus. So they were both blessed for their unselfish deeds. Yes, thank you. And Brother Perez. In Ruth chapter one, verses one and two, we see that... Uh, because of the famine, Noemi and her husband left Judah to reside as foreigners in the fields of Moab. And we could see this, this could be a challenge to keep the faith, especially being surrounded by non-worshippers of Jehovah. But we don't have much details, but we know that Noemi kept her faith strong with Jehovah without doubt by keeping up with her spiritual routine. And this is a good example for us today because uh, we could say that all of us in essence are foreigners and living in a world where most people aren't worshipers of Jehovah. But if we make every effort, like Noemi, to maintain our spiritual routine, we too can maintain our faith strong despite our surroundings. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, Brother Bosiaski. In Ruth uh, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we see that Orpah leaves Naomi, Ruth stays, 
but in part because of the advice that Naomi gave. So it's a reminder that we need to be careful whose advice we listen to. Even though Orpah did what Naomi asked her to do, that wasn't necessarily the right thing to do. And so we want to be careful to make sure that we're always obeying Jehovah rather than men. Very nice comment and nice job for everybody for their comments, for their well-prepared and well-researched uh, comments. And we really enjoyed that. Thank you very much, Brother Colon, and all those commenting for bringing those spiritual gems to our attention. Now, please find uh, in your Bible, Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and we will follow along as Brother Rodrigo Giron reads Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Now in the days when the judges administered justice, a famine occurred in the land. And a man went from Bethlehem in Judah to reside as a foreigner in the field to Moab, he along with his wife and his two sons. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the name of, names of his two sons were Malin and Kilian. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah, and they came to the field to Moab and remained there. After some time, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. The man later married Moabite women. One was named Orpah, and the other was named Ruth. They remained there for about 10 years. Then the two sons, Malin and Kilian, also died, and the woman was left without her two children and her husband. So she started out with her daughters-in-law to return from the field to Moab, for she had heard in Moab that Jehovah had turned his attention to his people by giving them food. She left the place where she had been living with both of her daughters-in-law. As they were walking on the road to return to the land of Judah, Naomi said to both of her daughters-in-law, go, return each of you to your mother's home. May Jehovah show loyal love to you, just as you have shown it to the men who have died and to me. May Jehovah grant that each of you finds security in the home of your husband. Then she kissed him and they wept loudly. They kept saying to her, no, but we will go with you to your people. But Naomi said, return my daughters. Why should you go with me? Can I still give you birth to sons who could become your husbands? Return my daughters, go for I have grown too old to marry. Even if I could hope to find a husband tonight, and could also bear sons, would you keep waiting for them until they could grow up? Would you refrain from getting remarried for their sakes? No, my daughters, I feel very bitter for you, because the hand of Jehovah has turned against me. Again, they wept loudly, after which Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and departed, but Ruth stuck with her. So Naomi said, look, your widow sister-in-law has returned to her people and her gods. Return with your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not plead with me to abandon you, to turn back from accompanying you. For where you go, I will go. And where you spend the night, I will spend the night. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May Jehovah do so to me, and add to it, if anything but death should separate me from you. Brother Hiram, thank you very much uh, for the way that you read that particular portion of the Bible. The point that you were demonstrating from the teaching brochure was study number 10, which is modulation, and that is a perfect a thing to work on for this particular reading. Modulating our voice means changing our pitch, the strength and power of our speech or, or the speed with which we talk. Uh, this helps us to convey ideas clearly and emotion uh, to bring it to light. And this one you did very well. That last little phrase by Ruth that she said, that where you die, I will die. The way you read that, communicated the emotion that she must have been feeling at that moment. So thank you very much. Now let's apply ourselves to the field ministry and turn our attention to Sister Elizabeth Perez and Sister Maricel Arroyo, 
who will demonstrate for us this month's initial call. Good morning, my name is Liz and my husband and I live around your neighborhood and I take an interest in how our neighbors are doing. Um, I'm sorry, you know, right now it's not a good time. I'm so sorry, is there a better time to call during the day? I don't know. Um, I have to take my husband to take a COVID test. And then later today, I have to make arrangements for appointments for my kids. So I'm, I'm swamped. I'm so sorry to hear that. I know how stressful that could be. Yes, I feel overwhelmed right now. I completely understand. You know, something that helps me personally with my stress right now is how much God doesn't forget about us. Can I share with you a Bible text that confirms that? I promise I'll be brief. Okay, but I do have to go soon. Okay. It's in Matthew 10, 29 to 31. It says, two sparrows sell for a coin of small value, do they not? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's knowledge. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So have no fear. You are worth more than many sparrows. Notice how much God pays attention to us. Yes, it, it says that he knows the number of hairs on our head. That, that's interesting. Yes, yeah, so if he knows that little detail of each one of us, even more in detail, he knows of all of our struggles that we're going through. How does that make you feel knowing that? It makes me feel seen that there's someone out there that cares. Exactly, and God doesn't just see us, but wants to help us. Another time, can I call and share how God helps us overcome our problems? Uh, sure. I, I would like that, actually. Uh, maybe next week? Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, my name is Liz, and yours? Uh, Marisa. Marisa, thank you again, and I hope everything turns out okay with you and your family. I appreciate that. Thank you. No problem. Have a good day. Thank you very much, sisters, for all of your hard work that you put into that and your fine teaching skills. Sister Perez, uh, the way that your voice communicated warmth and empathy is exactly what you were working on in the teaching brochure, study number 12, warmth and empathy. And the key verse that is mentioned in that brochure is 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. And one of the phrases it says is, we became gentle in your midst. We heard that quality in your voice when you understood the situation the person you were calling on was in. And to apply this in our ministry, one of the things the teaching brochure says is that we need to prepare, but specifically it says, prepare your heart by reminding yourselves of the problems they face, your listeners face, because doing so automatically will affect your word choice and our voice quality, just like it did for you. So thank you very much. Now we're going to turn our attention to Brother Jose Anarroyo and Brother Hayden Hilliard, who will demonstrate for us a return visit. Hi, Hayden. Thanks for taking my video call. How are you doing? Hey, Hosean, it's good to see you. Um, honestly, I'm not doing so good. I've been, I've been pretty stressed out lately. I know. I spoke with Aunt Car Carol, and, and she was telling me what was going on with your dad. It sounds like he's not doing too well. No, he's not. And, you know, right now we're not really sure what's going to happen, but at least right now he's stable. I'm sorry to hear that. Me and Maricel has, have you in our prayers. Yeah, I appreciate that. I do. Uh, you know, it, it makes me think about how you've been telling me that God is a loving father and that he cares. But right now, I just don't know about that. Hmm. He does care. He cares a lot about us. And he cares about you. He's very interested in what you're going through. In fact, I wanted to show you uh, something in the Bible. There's, there's the, I was telling you about this question last time, and I wanted to show the answer to it. If God cares about me, what is he thinking when he's looking at me going through problems? Knowing the answer to that question has really helped me cope with situations like the ones you're going through. Can I read it to you from the Bible? Yeah, please. I'd appreciate that. Well, in Jeremiah 29, 11, the answer of what God is thinking says, for I well know the thoughts 
that I am thinking toward you, declares Jehovah. Thoughts of peace and not of calamity, to give you a future and a hope. So based on what you just heard, what is God thinking now when he sees what you're going through with your dad? Well, it says that he thinks thoughts of peace towards me and not, not calamity. And then it mentions that hopeful future. That's it. And how, how does it make you feel knowing that Jehovah has a hopeful future for you? Well, it, I guess that makes me feel that he actually does care about me and that mine and my dad's situation, you know, will eventually get better. It will eventually get better. And knowing that can give us the strength to continue. You know, God cares about us so much that it's, he just doesn't leave it there. He also explains to us why these bad things happen. Can I show you a video about where we can find that explanation? Yeah, please. I'd love to. I'd love to know why. Okay. Well, I'm going to show the video to you now. Well, now that we've seen the video, do you remember those images at the beginning? Have you wondered about any of those things? Yeah, the one with the boy in the hospital bed definitely stood out to me. That, that hit home. Yeah, it can be difficult for us to understand why those bad things have to happen, especially to our loved ones. But did you also notice where millions of people have found the answer to those type of questions? Yeah, just like you've been teaching me, it said that those answers come from the Bible. Exactly. And we as Jehovah's Witnesses love to help other people find those answers. I would really like if we could study together the Bible. Would you be interested? Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Um, I don't know that right now is the best time. You know, I've got a lot on my plate, but, but I will think about it. I understand. And thank you. I I'm really glad you took my call, Hayden. And I do hope things get better soon. I'll call you back in a few days to check up on you and see how your dad's doing. And if you have some time, maybe we can continue the conversation. Yeah, that sounds good. I'd enjoy that. Uh, thanks for calling me, Hosea. Thanks. And all right, anytime. Thank you very much, brothers, for covering that information. And Brother Arroyo, we noted that you have a very confident and uh, calm demeanor about you that inspires confidence in others. That's a good quality to continue to use in your ministry. Now, the point in particular that you were demonstrating for us from the teaching brochure was study number nine, the appropriate use of visual aids. The theme text for that particular teaching point is Genesis 15, verse 5. And in that verse, Jehovah drew attention uh, to Abraham uh, about the stars, and he asked them to count them. Now, this is exactly what you did. You drew your students' attention to the video, but you just didn't let it go at that. You drew his offspring by uh, his, you drew his attention by asking questions, and those questions involved him in it and helped him draw a good conclusion. So, thank you very much for demonstrating that for us. Now, we'll listen to Brother Joel Gregory, who will discuss with us the theme: What makes a family? from the book, Imitate Their Faith. Brother Gregory, please. What makes a family? And during our study of the Bible, we've learned a lot about each of the roles in the family, how a husband can be a better husband, what types of qualities a wife needs to display, um, how children can obey their parents, or how parents can be better parents. However, in order to be a real family, do each of these roles need to be fulfilled? Really, what does Jehovah view as a real family? We know that as Jehovah's servants, Jehovah's viewpoint of this family is by far the most important. Well, during this discussion, we'll talk a little bit about Ruth and Naomi. We've gotten to learn quite a bit about them in the past couple of weeks. We studied about them uh, in the Watchtower article about loyal love. We're gonna read about them in our Bible reading. And in, we learned about them in our treasures part earlier today. Did Jehovah view them as a real family? 
At first glance, you may not think of them as a family, but please read with me Ruth 2, 17 through 20. Ruth 2, 17 through 20. And while we read these, uh, think about the different actions that Ruth and Naomi display, the different qualities that they display, and think if it seems like a family to you. Ruth 2, 17 through 20. So she continued to glean in the field until evening. When she beat out what she had gleaned, it came to about an ephah of barley. Then she took it and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. Ruth also took out and gave her the food that was left over after she had eaten her fill. Her mother-in-law then said to her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? May the one who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law about whom she had worked with saying, the name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. At that, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by Jehovah who has not failed in his loyal love toward the living and the dead. Naomi continued, the man is related to us. He is one of our purchasers. Did you notice what kind of qualities were displayed? Uh, during this day, during this exchange. Well, obviously, we continue to see Ruth showing loyal love, being a hard worker, being unselfish, uh, providing food not just for herself, but also for Naomi. And don't we see tenderness and warmth in Naomi, asking Ruth about her day, reminding her about how Jehovah is involved in all this process? Yes, when Jehovah looks for what a real family is, he's not looking for these traditional family roles, but he's looking for these kinds of qualities loyal love, tenderness, warmth. These are what truly makes a real family to Jehovah. Now we know that Ruth and Naomi were relatives. They were daughter-in-law and mother-in-law. What if we don't have any relatives that are close to us in our daily life? What if we're the only ones serving Jehovah? And because of that, there's not many relatives we have that are close to us that we would consider family. Can we still be a part of a family? Well, let's let Jesus answer that in Mark 10, 29 and 30. Mark 10, 29, and 30. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, no one has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not get a hundred times more now in this period of time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields with persecutions and in the coming system of things, everlasting life. So can we still be a part of a family now, even if we're not close to all of our relatives or to any of them? Of course, and Jesus reminds us that we can find this family in the Christian congregation. And as we just talked about, what makes a real family is the quality shown within. And in the Christian congregation, as part of Jehovah's Witnesses, we see these qualities shown time after time. During this pandemic, we've seen the loyal love, we've seen the tenderness and warmth, uh, people unselfishly giving of their time to go deliver food, uh, to be a part of Zoom calls. We know it's not natural for a lot of us to be on the computer, to be on Zoom, but people really make the effort to, to be unselfish and show this loyal love. And what can we do to make to be a part of this family? How can we fulfill our role in this family? Well, once again, we can continue to work on displaying these qualities, to show that unselfish love, to give of our time, and to truly imitate Jehovah's qualities. Yes, in this imperfect world, it may be true that we're not as close to our fleshly relatives. But we know that if we imitate Jehovah, that if we imitate his qualities and we stay close to him, Jehovah will make sure we are always a part of a family. Brother Gregory, thank you very much for your presentation there. The, the way you showed, demonstrated very good uh, thinking ability and uh, you presented your ideas very clearly and in a structured way. The point you were working on is from the teaching brochure study number 20, effective conclusion. It's hard to have an effective conclusion if you didn't put all that work into the initial part of your preparation, but you did. And that way, when you drew the conclusion at the end, it motivated the audience and it expressed comfort that if you do or you don't have family, you can still be part of a family and that's our family. So we thank you very much for that presentation. Thanks again to all our participants uh, this evening or this afternoon. Uh, it brings us now to the point where we can sing again in preparation for the Living as Christians portion of our meeting. So we invite you to sing with us song number 54, 
The title is This is the Way. It's based on Isaiah chapter 30, verses 20 and 21. So, Psalm 54. We always look forward to and really enjoy receiving updates from the governing body. So picking up again on the theme of the subject of loyal love, Brother Luis Perez will handle the part, Be Assured of Jehovah's Loyal Love. Brother Perez, please. You became precious in my eyes. That's how Jehovah expresses his feelings towards his servants in Isaiah 43, 4. And because he feels that way, we can be assured that Jehovah will take care of us even when times are extremely tough. Let's view the following video that shows us how Jehovah does this through his organization. During these last days, we often hear news reports about emergencies and natural disasters. Now, these are not just news headlines. These affect our brothers and sisters. As a result, branch offices around the world handle a wide variety of disasters. How does the Coordinators Committee of the Governing Body organize our response to such emergencies? And when emergencies occur, how do Bethelites at World Headquarters and at branches work together to support our brothers? No doubt you'll enjoy the following report from the Coordinators Committee. The number of disasters taking place worldwide is staggering. Earthquakes and other natural disasters are taking place in one place after another, just as Jesus said at Matthew 24, 7. Even where natural disasters are rare and the economy appears stable, violent protests, terrorist attacks, or epidemics can occur without warning. In 2018, the Coordinators Committee directed all branches to establish a disaster relief desk to oversee disaster preparedness and relief activities in their branch territory. 
Let's see how the disaster relief desk works in each of the branches. For example, in Indonesia, the disaster relief desk quickly responded following a massive earthquake and tsunami. When the earthquake occurred, I was at the hotel where I was working. People were falling, unable to stand up and run, so I decided to take cover under the door frame while holding the open door. I prayed to Jehovah. Jehovah, do remember us. I was so scared. We tried to break in since my mother was trapped in the room. I watched as the side wall of my room collapsed. I could finally escape with my child through the collapse wall. When we receive news at the branch office about the earthquake and tsunami, the disaster relief desk immediately assembled to discuss the situation. After a few hours, the circuit overseer could confirm that none of the publishers were injured. They were all safe. We immediately organized relief supplies. However, main roads were destroyed or blocked by landslide. Brothers from Balopo began the dangerous trek to Balu. The journey through the mountainous region took them nearly 30 hours. And amazingly, not a single meeting was missed. Their continued focus on spiritual matters impressed us very, very much. As with disaster relief desks in every branch, the brothers in Indonesia had received guidelines from the Coordinators Committee, which helped them be prepared. They quickly checked on the welfare of every publisher. They verified safe locations where publishers could evacuate, arranged for food and water, provided spiritual encouragement, and worked with the LDC to evaluate construction needs. The events in Indonesia illustrate how we respond to natural disasters. Epidemics present a very different set of challenges. Even in developed countries, disease can quickly threaten the lives of many people, spreading quietly and without warning. Through the prevalence of air travel, dangerous illnesses can spread to other lands before detection by health agencies. Motivated by love, we are quick to act because lives may be at stake. Let's see how our brothers in Nigeria responded to the outbreak of an unidentified but deadly disease. It was a big concern to the people in the community as well as to the branch committee that people were getting sick and dying suddenly, young ones as well as adults. And this included our dear brothers and sisters in the area. Hemorrhagic fever is a general term for a serious illness caused by many viruses. And at the outset, it's very difficult to know exactly what you're dealing with because they all have similar symptoms like headaches, muscle pain, nausea, and fever, things like that. The branch committee got together, prayed over the matter, and they decided that we needed to inform the governing body. When the governing body received our letter, they got in touch with us right away. In fact, they even set up an emergency video conference meeting with the branch committee. We received a letter from them that same day, providing us clear direction as to how we should proceed. I appreciated very much the direction that the branch committee gave us at that time. This direction came very fast, and they gave us plenty of spiritual, emotional, material support. The branch committee advised us that we should thoroughly wash our hands, use sanitizer, and cook our food properly. We were actually instructed by headquarters to restrict movement at Bethel, which means that no one could come in, no one could go out of Bethel. And that was up to 10 days. So we were, in effect, on a lockdown. It was difficult at first, but the brothers, they supported it very well. They realized that uh, their lives were at stake and they supported the branch arrangement. The hemorrhagic fever outbreak actually turned out to be yellow fever, which is transmitted by infected mosquitoes. We felt somewhat relieved 
although it's still dangerous, but it's not contagious and uh, it's preventable through vaccine. Just to be sure, we actually continue to uh, keep Bethel on lockdown and brothers were still being quarantined for a short period of time. I feel very, very happy. The organization arranged all these things for us. They were not passive, but instead quickly took action, and this made us feel safe. The governing body has trained us well in providing us guidelines for disaster relief. We have been taught by the organization that when a disaster strikes, that we need to be ready, we need to be quick, we need to be efficient, and we need to be safe. Good communication during times of disaster is really important. Various brothers from world headquarters from the committee offices met with the Nigeria branch to assess the situation and to be able to discuss the needs. So if an epidemic strikes in our area, there may be similar precautions that we need to take, just like the brothers did in Nigeria. Proverbs 15.22 says, Plans fail when there is no consultation, but there is accomplishment through many advisors. As we've seen from these two examples, when a disaster occurs, various departments at World Headquarters assist the Coordinators Committee to analyze the needs and deliver practical assistance to the branches. At the branch office, the Disaster Relief Desk works closely with the Service Department, Local Design Construction Department, and many other departments, depending on the nature of the emergency. All work together to help our brothers in need. When disasters strike, our brothers are quick to come to our aid. That is important because lives may be at stake. We always look to Jehovah during times of disaster. As we get deeper in the last days, we will likely have more opportunities to show love for one another through disaster relief. On behalf of the Coordinators Committee, we would like to thank all of the branch committees, the disaster relief desks, the brothers and sisters working in Bethel departments worldwide, the disaster relief committees, and all those who have volunteered their time and resources to help our brothers. When we think of you, the words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8 come to mind. So having tender affection for you, we were determined to impart to you not only the good news of God, but also our very selves, because you became so beloved to us. That is the spirit that you brothers and sisters have shown genuinely motivated by deep love for Jehovah and your brothers. You have been willing to give your very selves. Please know that we love all of you very much for the wonderful spirit that you show. Without a doubt, a very encouraging video for all of us. And we're gonna do a little review so the first question we have here is, how has the Coordinators Committee prepared branch offices around the world to respond to disasters? Brother Hiller? Well, in uh, 2018, the, coordinator commit, the Coordinators Committee directed all the branches to establish a disaster relief desk. And that desk was to oversee all, all the disaster preparedness and all of the disaster relief activity in each branch territory. Excellent. So we see how well organized this was. Um, so we'll go to the next question. How did Jehovah's organization provide direction and the disaster relief in Indonesia and Nigeria? So let's start with Indonesia. How did this happen? Uh, Sister uh, Raggett, sorry. Upon learning of the earthquake and tsunami, the disaster relief desk in Indonesia communicated with circuit overseers and it was confirmed that all the publishers were safe. Then relief efforts were organized and the dangerous 30 hour trip was made and all spiritual meetings were held. 
And this all was due to the coordinator committee's earlier guidelines to the branches. It helped everything go quickly and smoothly. So food and water was provided and further assistance such as making sure that everything, uh, everyone was okay did happen. Great, perfect. So well organized. What about in Nigeria? How did this happen? Uh, Brother Colon? Well, I appreciated how they realized that they needed to go to the governing body to see their direction um, with uh, this unidentified at the time, which we learned um, actually became, um, they found out was yellow fever, but they immediately went to the governing body to get the direction and immediately it was a lockdown, especially at Bethel um, until they get everything sorted out. So we can see right there, it was a matter of being safe. They did more research found out when it was yellow fever that it could be avoided through vaccination and then got everybody vaccinated to keep everybody safe. Excellent. So, and without that, we see Jehovah's loyal love in action in these two cases. So the last question we have here, what have you appreciated about the organization's response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Brother Hiron? I appreciate it how Jehovah has make us has made us feel protected through the organization, and I appreciate that they're not uh, reactive but rather proactive by always uh, taking care of us with the letters and giving us the direction of what to do and what to expect. Excellent, Sister Bradley. I appreciate how the organization made arrangements through LDC for food distribution in 2020, uh, especially when it wasn't easy to get during that time period. Um, I know I had a, a lot of friends that did mention that oftentimes that box would come just at the right time for their family. So really seeing how the organization was quick to, to use whatever arrangements possible to, to give that to us, I truly appreciate that. Great, thank you. And as we've seen in this video, and as we see now what we're facing right now, we have seen very clear and we have no doubt that at all that Jehovah will continue to show his loyal love to us even when times become extremely difficult. Thank you very much uh, for covering that part about the 2000, 2019 Coordinators Committee Report, Brother Perez, and highlighting the many ways that Jehovah cares for us through his organization, and it is especially apropos right now, considering the global pandemic. Now, it is time for us to turn our attention to the Congregation Bible Study, where we will continue in chapter 19 and start with paragraph 7. So let's give our attention to Brother uh, Frankie Raggetts and his reader, Brother David Bradley. Well, last week in our Bible study, we began to consider section five of our book, and this is going to focus on the pure worship of Jehovah being restored. And last week, we started to talk about this river flowing from the temple. It was a stream at first, and then it became a river. And interestingly about this vision, some visions have perhaps one fulfillment, some two. This one has three different times when it's fulfilled. And so last week, we began considering the ancient fulfillment, we considered two aspects of it, the river of blessings and life-giving water. Today, we'll consider the third aspect in the ancient fulfillment, and then we'll move on to how it's being fulfilled today. And this is exciting for us because we're a part of this. We're living during this time. So we look forward to your comments. As Brother Tiglis mentioned, we start on paragraph seven, page 205. Let's listen to Brother Bradley as he reads this paragraph for us. Trees for food and healing. What of those trees along the riverbanks? They add to the beauty of the picture, do they not? They also add to its meaning. Ezekiel and his countrymen surely enjoyed thinking of the delicious fruit that such trees would provide, a new crop every month. That appealing picture further reassured them that Jehovah would feed them spiritually. And what else? Note that the leaves of those trees will serve for healing. 
Jehovah knew that, above all, the returning exiles would need spiritual healing, and he promised to provide just that. How he did so was discussed in other restoration prophecies, as we have noted in chapter 9 of this publication. So our question for paragraph 7, the presence of the visionary trees along the riverbanks gave the exiled Jews what reassurance? Sister Bradley? Well, it gave this assurance that um, Jehovah would feed them spiritually. I was thinking how this must have really impacted them because, you know, we know a fruit tree, it, it's only going to have a certain length of time where there'll be a crop or um, depending where we live, we may not, we, we may only have certain seasons where we would even get fruit from trees. But yet here, it said that it would be every month. So this really showed that this would be a continued thing and Jehovah would give them this food spiritually. Good. Thank you, Sister Bradley. And Brother Cologne, please. Yes, and in Ezekiel 47, 12, we see that these trees will also serve for healing. And we know that the nation of Israel was uh, spiritually sick. So we know um, through this prophecy that these returning exiles would actually need spiritual healing. So something else that they had something to look forward to. Good. Thank you, Brother Cologne. That was nicely done. Let's uh, move a little further on this in paragraph eight. However, as we also discussed in chapter nine, the returning exiles experienced only a limited fulfillment of such prophecies. It was the people themselves who limited that fulfillment. How could Jehovah bless them fully when backsliding, disobedience, and neglect of pure worship were often prevailed among them? Faithful ones were pained and disappointed by the conduct of their fellow Jews. However, loyal worshipers of Jehovah knew that his promises never fail. They always come true. Hence, one day Ezekiel's vision would have a greater fulfillment. But when? So before we ask our question for this paragraph, we're going to have Sister Raggetts read Joshua 23, 14, when we all get that. Now look, I am about to die, and you well know with all your heart and with all your soul that not one word out of all the good promises that Jehovah your God has spoken to you has failed. They have all come true for you. Not one word of them has failed. Thank you, Sister Raggetts. So our question, what shows that Ezekiel's vision would have a greater fulfillment? Brother Gregory, please. Well, we know that Jehovah can only bless his people fully when they're obeying him. And the Jews uh, had a poor track record of backsliding, disobedience, neglect. Um, so even in this time when the exiles returned, they would only experience a limited fulfillment of these prophecies. Thank you, Brother Gregory. And Sister Bradley, please. And so these promises were conditional. <laughs> so if, if the Israelites and Jews didn't uh, hold up their end of the bargain, then the promise uh, would have that limited fulfillment. And so because that was the case, this helps us to see, again, Jehovah promised these things would happen and these things would continue, but they haven't happened yet. So obviously this shows there is a, a greater fulfillment to come. Good. Thank you, Sister Radley. Brother Hiron. And Joshua 23, 14, um, that was a scripture that the faithful Jews definitely remembered that none of Jehovah's promises would go, um, none of them would fail. So they knew that this promise, since it was conditional, it would have to happen in the future. Excellent. So we considered these points well. Uh, we've considered now last week and this week how in ancient times, this was fulfilled, but let's now look forward to today. And our heading is, the river flows today. Let's read paragraph nine, please. As we noted in chapter 14 of this publication, Ezekiel's temple vision has a greater fulfillment during the final part of the days. 
the time when pure worship is exalted as never before. In what sense is this part of Ezekiel's vision being fulfilled right now? When does Ezekiel's temple vision have a greater fulfillment? Let's hear from Sister Arroyo, please. Uh, the prophecy shows that it would be in the final part of the days because that's when pure worship would be exalted like never before. Thank you, Sister Arroyo. And in talking about the final part of the days, what time is that? Brother Tiglis. Uh, that is now. We're experiencing it. And so we can see this river flowing today. Good. Thank you. Let's read paragraphs 10 and 11, please. A river of blessings. The water flowing from Jehovah's house reminds us of what blessings today. Really, we are reminded of all that contributes to our spiritual health and nourishment. Foremost is the cleansing power of Christ's ransom sacrifice, which makes the forgiveness of our sins possible. The pure truths of God's word are also likened to life-giving cleansing water. How have such blessings flowed in our time? In 1919, there were only a few thousand servants of Jehovah, and they were thrilled to receive the spiritual food they needed. In the decades that followed, their ranks kept swelling. Today, God's people number well over 8 million. Has the flow of the pure waters of truth kept pace? Yes, we have an almost overwhelming supply of spiritual truth. Literally billions of Bibles, books, magazines, brochures, and tracts have flowed out to God's people in the past century. Like the visionary river that Ezekiel saw, the flow of pure truths has expanded rapidly to meet the growing needs of spiritually thirsty people worldwide. Bible-based publications have long been available in printed form, and now, by means of the website jw.org, such material is available electronically in over 900 languages. How do such waters of truth affect right-hearted people? So the A question, what blessings flow to us like a river today? Now let's start with Sister Raggetts. We are grateful for the cleansing power of Jesus Christ's ransom sacrifice. This provision uh, really makes it possible for the forgiveness of our sins. And then we're also very appreciative of the pure truths from Jehovah's Word, the Bible. And these are likened to uh, life-giving cleansing water. Thank you, Sister Raggetts. And how does Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 support that and help us? In fact, you might even use the study note from our Bible. Perhaps we could have a reader for that scripture. Who would like to read Ephesians 5, 25 to 27? Let's hear from uh, oh, Brother Hilliard, please. It says, husbands, continue loving your wives, just as the Christ also loved the congregation and gave himself up for it, in order that he might sanctify it, cleansing it with the bath, bath of water by means of the word so that he might present the congregation to himself in its splendor without a spot or a wrinkle or any of such things, but holy and without blemish. I thank you, Brother Hilliard, for that good reading. So from that scripture, and especially there in verse 26, how do we benefit from that? Brother uh, Bozioski. Well, the verse really highlights the cleansing power of the truth. And that is so true. How would we know how to please Jehovah, how to conduct ourselves, what things to avoid if it weren't for the truth? And uh, certainly how Jehovah uses the faithful slave to help us to understand the truth and how that has become clearer. And we see over the years, even in re relatively recent times, Jehovah's people 
have become more and more morally clean. They abandoned certain bad practices, such as smoking, when they realized that that conflicted with the truth. Good. Thank you, Brother Bozioski. Brother Hiron. Just as a bride in Israel uh, bath and adorn herself, so does the bride of Christ, the Christian congregation. And how do we, how did how does that happen? Well, applying Bible principles in our lives, um, just like God's word is compared to water, it cleanses us and therefore is uh, cleaned. Very good. And our B question, how has the flow of blessings from Jehovah expanded to meet the growing needs during the last days? Sister Tiglis, please. Well, we see since 1919, Jehovah's servants have grown from a few thousand to over eight and a half million worldwide. So to keep up with that, the spiritual food has also grown. So we have billions of books, Bibles, magazines, brochures, and tracts, but we also have electronic materials such as we, what we find on JW.org and in over 900 languages. Thank you, Sister Tiglis. Brother Tiglis. Thinking back to the time period they mentioned here with 1919, um, when the brothers were released from prison and they decided to have a convention there at Cedar Point, they turned to look for what they had to print to go out and service because that's what they really wanted to do is get the ministry going. And the tracts were all destroyed. They had destroyed the place. They couldn't even make any more. So the amount of spiritual food they had was very minimal. So they decided to invent a new magazine, The Golden Age, which is now The Awake. And when you take that very sparse beginnings in 1919, where there was almost nothing, to what we see today, where people can download from the internet all across the globe at any hour of the day in 900 languages, it's amazing. Well, thank you, Brother Tiglis. Brother Bozioski. And I couldn't help but think uh, with the way the questions worded expanded to meet growing needs during the last days. Uh, we've had our website up and running for years now. It keeps getting better and more complete, more languages, but has it ever become a powerful tool during the pandemic where now it's become almost impossible to physically give people literature anymore, yet we have a website that's better than ever with information that we can use in the ministry and share with people immediately. Oh, beautiful comments, everyone. Nicely done. So we've considered the river brings blessings. Let's move to the next feature, life-giving water. We'll have paragraph 12 read for us. Life-giving water. Ezekiel was told, everything will live wherever the stream goes. Think of the way the message of the truth has flowed to all those who have come into our restored spiritual land. Bible truths have brought life and spiritual health to millions of receptive hearts. However, the vision also conveys a timely warning. Not all remain receptive to such truth. Like the marshy and swampy places in the Dead Sea in Ezekiel's vision, there are hearts that become unreceptive, refusing to accept and apply the truth. May that never be true of us. Our A question, how have we seen the message of the truth bring spiritual life and health to people? Brother Arroyo, please. Well, we've seen it on ourselves, for sure, um, how the truth has bettered our lives. Um, we become more hopeful, uh, a, a stronger source of encouragement for our families. And we've seen it also with uh, Bible studies and people who come to the meetings not just spiritual, but even physically, uh, learning the truth can even help them get rid of addictions and behaviors that affects them. Thank you, Brother Arroyo. Very nice. And before we ask our B question, we'd like someone to volunteer to read Deuteronomy 10, 16 to 18. Let's have Brother Gregory read that for us, please. You must now cleanse your hearts and stop being so stubborn. For Jehovah your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the God great, mighty, and awe-inspiring, who treats none with partiality and does not accept a bribe. He executes judge justice for the fatherless child and the widow 
and loves a foreign resident, giving him food and clothing. Good reading, Brother Gregory. Thank you. What timely warning does the vision convey to us today? We can also include a footnote, the footnote in our comment. Uh, let's hear from Sister Bradley first. Well, there in Deuteronomy, we see the exhortation to stop being stubborn. <laughs> so really, if we're being stubborn, then we're putting ourselves uh, in amongst that marshy, swampy area where we may begin to be unreceptive to the, to the cleansing waters, the life-giving waters. Um, Thank you, Sister Bradley. Brother Hilliard, please. Yeah, similar thought when thinking about not being stubborn and talking about this life flowing river. It reminds me of that saying, you can lead the horse to the water, but you can't make it drink. So we can't change people's hearts. And sometimes we'd really like to, especially when it's our family members. But all we can do is keep an eye on ourselves and make sure our necks don't become stiff. And like Ezekiel, share Jehovah's message that he asks us to. Very good, Brother Hilliard. Brother Bradley, please. And our footnote there highlights Jesus' illustration of the dragnet and how not everyone that accepts the truth will, will stay as a faithful servant of Jehovah. And it reminded us there that there will be many that would leave Jehovah's organization. And so uh, if we apply this, this counsel we're receiving here through Ezekiel's visions, then we can help our, our hearts to not become those unreceptive hearts and make sure we're not one of those individuals that Jesus spoke about. Very good. Thank all of you. Uh, let's now move to the third component, trees for food and healing. We'll have the reading of paragraph 13. Trees for food and healing. Do the visionary trees along the riverbanks convey encouraging lessons to us today? Certainly. Remember, those trees produced a new crop of delicious fruit every month and their leaves provided healing. They thus remind us that we serve the God who generously feeds us and heals us in the most important way, spiritually. Today's world is sick and starving in a spiritual sense. By contrast, think of what Jehovah provides. Have you ever come home, have you ever come to the end of an article in one of our journals? sung the concluding song at an assembly or a convention, or finished watching a video or broadcast program and felt blessed to have such spiritual food? We are truly well fed. Does our spiritual food promote spiritual health? The wholesome counsel we receive, based solidly on God's word, helps us to fight off such spiritual enemies as immorality, greed, and lack of faith. Jehovah has also put in place an arrangement to help Christians overcome spiritual sickness brought on by serious sin. We are indeed blessed, just as suggested by Ezekiel's vision of the trees. Who would read for us James 5, 14? Let's hear from Sister Tiglis, please. James 5, 14 says... Is there anyone sick among you? Let him call the elders of the congregation to him and let them pray over him, applying oil to him in the name of Jehovah. Thank you, Sister Tiglis. Our question for 13, what lessons may we draw from those visionary trees? Sister Tiglis, is your hand still up? No? Okay. Brother Boziowski, please. Well, one lesson is that uh, has to do with the healing and how Jehovah has put in place an arrangement to help us to continue to battle our weaknesses, even overcome serious sins, and continue to serve him uh, in a restored spiritual condition. So the healing power of what he provides is a nice lesson. Good. Thank you very much, Brother Cologne. And of course, um, as well as healing, just feeding off of God's word does a lot. Uh, the paragraph mentions that it helps fight off spiritual enemies as immorality, greed, and lack of faith. 
So we see there, not only do we get the spiritual food and feed off of it, but we have to meditate and put our part in it to fight off all of these bad inclinations that we have in order to truly benefit from the spiritual food and the healing. Good. Brother Hilliard, please. And we've seen that healing in very real ways, uh, along with that, or read scripture in James about having the, the elders come and pray over someone. When we see someone that's uh, really distressed and almost beyond consoling, when we pray for that peace of God, and throughout that conversation, the, a calmness comes over them. And so Jehovah's healing is, is, is in our lives in a very real way. Good. And Brother Gregory, please. And I really like that <clears throat> question in the paragraph where it says, have you ever felt blessed after finishing watching a broadcast program or a convention? I think we've all had that moment where we're watching a video during the convention tearing up or um, a broadcast maybe about a past annual meeting or Gilead or something like that. And all those times that we feel that is, is just proof that the spiritual food is really getting to our heart. Excellent. Brother Perez, please. And I like the scripture in Isaiah 65, 13, 14, how we see the contrast that we we have as servants of Jehovah between the world that today we see how it says like that we won't be hungry, but the people in the world are hungry. And we see that we will be rejoiced, we will be joyful. And we see that in this Ezekiel's prophecy, how that how true is that today? that contrast and it keeps keeps us motivated to keep um, spiritually active and spiritually fed by Jehovah's generous. Good reminders for us to reflect on that. Very good, thank you, Brother Perez. Nice comment. Well, let's move to our last two paragraphs, 14 and 15. At the same time, we may take a lesson from those unhealed marshy places. Never would we want to refuse to let Jehovah's blessings flow into our life. It would be tragic to remain unhealed like so many in this sick world. Rather, we are delighted to benefit from the river of blessings. When we eagerly drink in the pure waters of truth from God's word, when we share such truths with others by means of the preaching work, when we receive loving guidance, comfort, and help from elders who have been trained by the faithful slave, we may think of Ezekiel's visionary river. That river promotes life and healing wherever it goes. What though about a future fulfillment of this visionary river? As we will see, the river will flow into the greatest possible sense in the paradise to come. Brother Bradley, thank you very much for that excellent reading today. We enjoyed it. Our A question, what lesson should we take from the unhealed marshy places in Ezekiel's vision. Uh, let's start with Brother Colon. Well, as we learned, uh, those unhealed marshy places are those who do not want to accept God's truth. And uh, Matthew 13, 15 talks about that their hearts are unreceptive, that they see they don't want to see anything, they don't want to hear it, and they just turn back away from being healed. And the lesson for us really is that we have to be humble and realize that we could very easily, if we're not careful, become part of that unhealed marshy places or those who don't want to be receptive to the truth. So we must always be on guard to continue to allow Jehovah's word to um, flow in our lives. Thank you, Brother Colon. Brother Arroyo. And the paragraph reminds us that this world is sick. Um, most of the world is a marshy place. So we have to put more effort then into staying close to that river and letting Jehovah flow uh, into our hearts. Nice. Sister Bradley. So really, it would be good for us to ask ourselves some, some uh, penetrating questions, um, whether or not we're really taking advantage of these waters that are being flowed to us, or do we maybe have an attitude that keeps us from really taking benefit of some of those spiritual that those provisions, that spiritual water, um, are we maybe getting too close to those marshy areas? Those are things for us to really look and see where we are. So then we're really taking this warning to heart. Thank you. And our B question, how does Ezekiel's visionary river benefit us today? 
Sister Raggetts, please. Well, first we can individually drink in these pure waters of truth from the Bible. And once we do that, then we can share those truths with others through the preaching work. And when I receive loving guidance and comfort and help from the others, it does help me think of this river that we're discussing. Good, thank you, Sister Raggetts. Brother Tiglis, please. I find it fascinating that so many years ago, he knew, Jehovah knew that there would be these marshy places. He knew people would do that. And it's a powerful lesson for us today to benefit from the sweet water and stay away from those marshy places because somebody's going to be there, but it doesn't have to be us. Excellent. What a good reminder. And, and what a beautiful lesson we had today, uh, considering the final part of the ancient fulfillment and then today's fulfillment of this river. And we might want to reflect on this during the coming week. And then next week, we'll be considering something perhaps equally exciting or even more, we'll be considering what the vision means for us in paradise. But we really should give thanks to Jehovah for the abundant provisions he makes for our spiritual health. These three different aspects of that vision helped us to see this. And as we show ourselves thankful, let us take advantage of everything Jehovah has given us so that we can be part of the pure worship that he is restored today. Thank you, Brother Raggetts, um, Brother Bradley, for the handling that part and helping us to learn more about Ezekiel's vision, especially highlighting the modern and practical applications for us today. Now, with our meeting this week, we have been reminded of the quality of loyal love, that deep attachment that Jehovah feels towards us and that we can develop between fellow believers. We saw how it was manifest between Ruth and Naomi, and today we see it in action on a global scale and on how this uh, disaster relief is cared for in all levels of the organization, and we deeply appreciate that. We were also prepared for the ministry for this week and weekend, keeping our message clear, reminding us to be empathetic, and to make our conclusion concise and clear. Um, next week, we have something else to look forward to. We're going to explore how to maintain a good reputation. We'll also review a video entitled, Help Your Bible Students to Attend Meetings. And at our congregation Bible study, we'll look further into Ezekiel's vision and ask the question, do you picture yourself in paradise, surrounded by friends and family, enjoying life to the full? Well, we certainly look forward to learning about that. To conclude our meeting today, uh, we'd like to invite all to sing along uh, a song to Jehovah, Song 97. The title is Life Depends on God's Word, based on Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. And after we sing that song, we'll hear a prayer uh, concluding our meeting by Simon Bosievsky. Again, that's Song 97. <laughs> 